Well, hello! It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And, last, I've got a couple of topics, one from last week that I'm going to bring up. So, uh, I don't know if I have a big call to action here this week, but uh, what the heck, let's dive into the pens, because that's what we're here for. Alright, so these are the pens that I've been using this week from left to right. We have my Pax from Hungary, which I discussed this week. I have a Luxor 156, which I feel like I did that one recently, but not like super recently. Uh, Omas Ojiva, which is I've had for years. Uh, Lamy All Star, which I've also had for years. And Mombol 32, which I've had for years. Penal, or sorry, Penal Ambassador, which I think I did that one last summer. Uh, Waterman Hemisphere, which, no, sorry, sorry, Waterman Karen. <laughs> which I've had for years, and this uh, Nakaya Decapod Twist, which um, I think I've had that one for a few years. i got to look this stuff up. I don't remember anymore how long I've had these things. As always, I will be doing my writing in the in this, uh, I almost said Boma Art Journal, that era is no more, uh, this Cognitive Surplus Notebook. So my first pen tonight is the PAX which is actually uh, was produced by Pevdi, which is a Hungarian maker. I, I know I have re reviewed a uh, Pevdi on this channel before. Uh, one thing I found, you know, I, I, of course, I liked this ink window very much. It definitely has a Parker 45-esque look to it. I was going to have the Parker 45 here, but I don't. One of the more disturbing things I've found is I'm getting a little rust, a little rust there. I had a big bloop of rust up back here, but it seems to have worn off, and I see a little corroding there. And when I look inside the cap, which is really hard to do with my setup, let's see. Uh, there we go. You can kind of make out, sorry, I'm trying to center it and light it. You can kind of make out the rust inside of it. So, yeah, I'm going to give it a little um, clean. It's almost empty anyway, so I'll give it a little clean, and I'm going to think about the rust thing and research that because that's a new one on me. I've run into a few Chinese pens that will rust inside, uh, you know, like the rivet that holds the finial in place or something, but uh, never something to this extent. So the ink in this, and it does seem to dry out. I mean, not to the point it's a hard start or anything, but it does dry out, so the ink is a little darker to start with. I haven't written with it since yesterday. So it's morning, so, you know. Parker Quink Washable Blue. So it's a wet pen, and it's just a little darker because uh, it dries up a little overnight. Now, I, do, I haven't ever had a hard start problem with this pen, so I am quite pleased with it. I just uh, don't like the rust thing, because pens aren't supposed to do that. I mean... Oh, just don't put your pen around water. Okay, yeah. Ink is water. That's the main ingredient. You would think a pen maker would keep that in mind, but of course we're talking a slightly different world from other businesses. Because uh, it's a communist era pen. This next pen is a Luxor 156. I really enjoy the detail on this particular pen. You know, the chasing and the ebonite finish has the uh, original Luxor stuff here. Details on the clip, on the finial. Well, just a very nice 1930s pen. So this is a Luxor. Uh, the ink in it is Monte Grappa Bordeaux. So, f 
far, uh, my swatches seem to be bigger than the names of the pens. I wonder if I should do an X like this to show off the... Let's see if I can get into that habit. Just to try out the uh, obliqueness. That's kind of ugly. I don't know if I, that's going to catch on. I'll try it with one or two more pens. We'll see. I, I may just stick with my regular swatch. But, you know, I talked a week or two ago about why I do the swatches this way. And it is to show off, you know, the varying line width and stuff. But uh, then I started thinking about obliqueness. I'm like, well, it doesn't really show that. And I do the weird little uh, asterisk um, my reviews to show obliqueness. So... And I don't have an oblique nib for this week, so. But, I don't know, I'll try it. Maybe when I get more comfortable. Omas Ojiva. Of course, I just had a pen pal tell me that she's now doing these swatches. So I'm going to mess with her world if I uh, change up how I do them now. This is a medium extra flexibile nib. I didn't really show you the pen, did I? I just started writing. Aroshizuku Yuyake. So before uh, we dive into the pen, uh, swatch, maybe I'll quick show you the pen. So, nice demonstrator. No longer made. The company is out of business. Uh, I'm told that there are businesses that have picked up parts and manufacturing techniques. Uh, what was it Aiden Burnell, who's also a pen reviewer, did a short video about a pen repair on one of these he did this week. So uh, I'm hoping that's far in my future because parts are an issue. So yeah, it's a nice, it's a fun pen. I picked it up in a brief period when they'd gone out of business and people weren't saying, oh, wait a second, I should buy them up and pay a premium for them. So I was lucky. I didn't quite get the nib or the color I wanted, but it's really grown on me. So I think it's okay. There, I'm feeling a little more comfortable with this swatch. Oh, might grow on me, I don't know. <laughs> my next pen, using for envelopes, I used up my Noodler's Fox in the Safari, so I thought I'd use its brother, the Lamy All-Star. A little scratched up. Because I actually use my pens. Although, some people collect these, I'm just more of a user. If I can't use the pen, what's the point in having it? Okay, I have one or two that are just kind of delicate that I don't like to use, but, you know. So this is a Lamy All-Star. The ink in it is Sailor Storia. Or they're hard to clean out. Some pens are just a pain to clean out, so I don't like to ink them up because I know how much work it'll be to clean them. Or, yeah, I don't like to fill them because it's such work to... I don't know what I mean. And I should be very articulate right now because it's early in the morning. And uh, what time is it? Well, not that early anymore. 10 o'clock. But still, I should be articulate and I'm not. <laughs> haven't finished my coffee. Usually I've finished my coffee by now. I've had like, yeah, I haven't even had a quarter of this yet. Why? I don't know. Anyway, this is a nice permanent ink. I did a video on these inks. I'll try to, whoops, I'll try to remember to link it down in the video description. I did it a number of years ago. I bought uh, samples of all of them. And as uh, I've said a few times, ink videos take a lot of work. It's, it's easier for me to do a pen video or even a pen repair video. And you know, I need to do a couple of those too. Later today, I'm going to film a video 
at least the writing sample of a mercurate that I picked up, a vintage pen. It turned out it just needed some cleaning and phew, perfect. I thought I was going to have to take it apart and grease the piston because I was so squeaky, but working great. Whoops, and I kind of did the ink off screen. <laughs> Okay, this this is what you you get what you pay for with this channel. Have you joined yet? As is, oh no, you can't join because I don't have memberships. I don't even do what is they call it? not PayPal the other thing Patreon. Just too lazy to do any of that. Oh, okay, what was I about to say about this pen? Something intelligent probably. Oh, I remember it's a Mont Blanc. And I like it because it's not the big monster like the 149, which I don't own one. Uh, just a nice daily writer pen. I have another Mont Blanc. I need to publish its review. It's probably coming soon because I just recently published... Um, I, I, I store my raw footage on Dropbox, which I know probably not what I'm supposed to do, but that's what I do. And so I... And then I just keep it in the cloud till I'm ready for it so it doesn't fill up my computer. Well, I just pulled five videos out of the cloud and put them on my computer. And that Mont Blanc is one of them. So you're probably going to see that in a few weeks. I'm um, kind of a... Uh, I like it. In fact, as uh, Senator Silver Fox ran out of ink this week, I went to that Mont Blanc. And I'm, it's a Mont Blanc 225 if you're interested. So it's kind of got that Lamy 2000 feel to it. So, <laughs> of course I like it. But anyway, back, back on topic. Um, so this is a Mont Blanc 32. I, I showed you the bird splats. So just a daily writer type of pen, not a expensive luxury pen. So Lamy 32. Has an extra flexible, no, sorry, 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 extra fine nib. Califolio. Noir. So I should show you the, it's got one of those fingernail type nibs. Somebody called it intarsia, inlaid. So I don't know what they're called really. Expert on fountain pens, I am not. I am a hobbyist who happens to have gotten into restoring vintage fountain pens. Uh, somebody found one of my old videos recently, and uh, I was talking about, yeah, I've got about as many pens as I'll ever have, and probably if I'd stuck with new, that would have been very close to true. See, now I'm supposed to do the diagonals up there and the vertical and horizontals down here with my new way, but I screwed it up. Oops! So I will look at the video footage later, see if I like that. But Anyway, yeah, if I'd stuck with modern pens... I would have lost interest. I, you know, there's a couple nice ones I would have bought. I'd, I'd have the very last one you're going to see tonight, the Nakaya, probably. But there's a lot of pens I just wouldn't own because I would have been, eh, another Yovo Nib, yay. Okay. Penal Ambassador Special. I probably should write special in its name. Because it's special. So this is a button filler pen. Uh, from Denmark of the 1940s, probably. Um, I thought I was done with this ink. I used up my bottle. Uh, this is the last dregs of the that bottle, because the uh, ambassador. Uh, I dumped the rest into a sample bottle because I could, just couldn't get at it anymore. And then a viewer and pen pal sent me... <laughs> A new bottle! So I now have a bottle of, Ju of Colorverse Jupiter Flyby again. So thank you, even though uh, I was trying to get rid of it. I do enjoy this ink. So uh, I'm just going to have to set my goals on using up some other stuff. And holy cow, I felt, um, I, I should mention here with this Califolio Noir, that looks kind of like a blue-gray. I mean, very dark blue-gray. Um, it's not an ink I really care for and uh, one I'd like to use up. And somebody said, dump it down the sink. 
Yeah, but I spent money on it. So, I will just soldier on and use it up somehow. So I one of the things I enjoy about this uh, Jupiter flyby ink is it goes on sort of a red color, kind of like Jupiter's red spot, but then it dries to a brown. And with the shading, you even get uh, you know hints of the striations on Jupiter's clouds, because you know the brown clouds and the white clouds seem to be in stripes, or at least it looked like that the last time I was there. Lately, I've been reading that uh, most of the colonization efforts are starting to look at Titan as an option, which is a moon of Saturn. And yeah, Saturn's got the cool little rings, but doggone it, Jupiter, it's symbolic. We've got to be around Jupiter. That's where our colonies should be. For no practical reason, just for because it's cool. Okay. That's why I don't get to decide the space, mi space missions. <laughs> This is a Waterman Karen, the amber finish. Uh, I really like this. You can get it in more expensive finishes, of course. But I just like this one. I saw a green version of this that I really liked too, but it's no longer made. And I've already got a Karen, so I just said, eh, missed your chance there, squirrel. So this is a Waterman Karen. Used to call it Waterman's, but not anymore. Vintage is uh, usually Waterman's. Uh, this has a broad nib on it. When I bought it, it had a medium, but I was able to find a broad nib, which I like a lot better. And the ink in it is almost used up. It's Diamine Skull and Roses, which is a fun shading ink. Sheening! Sorry, sheening ink. I should drink the rest of that coffee before I continue talking. Especially when I get to the controversial me-talking part at the end. Uh, so I'm actually articulate and don't say something stupid. Yeah, I say stupid stuff all the time. <laughs> I am like the king of stupid. Of course, I can edit it when it's on video. Uh, I've, I've uploaded so, two different bits of raw footage of me doing these just from the side. You know, where I didn't have the writing sample for some reason. And uh, <laughs> in both of them, you found out that I swear when I make mistakes. And I did not realize, especially the one I just, you know, used the F word, used every single bad word you could. <laughs> uh, last year when we were on lockdown, I filmed a lot of videos for my students. And I even remarked on it on Facebook once. Um how much I swear when I'm editing videos. And I don't swear a lot. I mean, I do swear. I'm not scared of the words. I try not to do it at school. But I do swear, but not often. <laughs> but apparently when putting videos together, I do. Not today, actually. I don't think I've said one yet. I, I'll find out when I uh, edit the video together. But I don't think I've sworn today. It's usually when I screw up and do something stupid, then I'm just like, oh, flipper nipper. So let's talk about the last pen. This is, what is this? Nakaya Decapod Twist. I am so sorry. Um, one of those pens that your viewership bought me because of the advertising dollars. Um, I just enjoy this finish a lot. But I wouldn't care. I wouldn't have even bought the pen, except I know I like the nib. I knew I would like it because I've used the cheaper version of this. Some people don't like platinum nibs, because yes, this is a platinum nib. This is the same nib as on a platinum 3776. I'm trying to remember. Nakaya. <laughs> um, it just has different branding stamped on it. So this is a Nakaya Decapod Twist. Has a soft, fine nib. And the ink in it is Ackermann. 
Did I spell that right? I did. Grunmark Smaragd. I'm worried about spelling Ackerman right. Yipe! I should probably get Stephen Brown to tell me how to pronounce these. Grunmarkt Smaragd. True story, I've never met another pen reviewer in my life. Uh, I write to a few occasionally as pen pals, but I've never met one in the flesh. So maybe when this pandemic is over and I feel safe to travel, which by the way, as of this week, I am theoretically fully vaccinated because the two weeks after getting my shot have passed. So I guess I'm about as safe as I can get for the moment. Doesn't mean I'm abandoning all precautions, but uh, I am taking a few more risks. So those are the pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. A um, couple nice ones there. I'm, uh, I'm I'm really enjoying that Luxor. I wish I'd inked it up sooner. I. Uh, and that PAX was a really nice surprise, and I've almost run it empty in one week. So, yeah, a lot of fun here. Um, and, and I did bring up, because I filmed this week, I'll, I'll show you the package, I won't show you the pen, but I filmed, um, well, it's out of focus, but anyway, <laughs> this package, it's a Lintz pen. Uh, so last week I talked a, quite at length about packaging for shipping pens, and then, of course, for selling pens. And uh, you probably know that modern packaging is a little more elaborate than that, usually. I, uh, I kind of like those simple cardboard boxes. I, I shipped some pens to uh, another pen reviewer recently with uh, little cardboard boxes like that from ProtoPens. In fact, ProtoPens sends their, their pens to me in that when uh, I buy pens from them. So... Uh, yeah, I, I like these simple cardboard boxes. So it doesn't have to be fancier. And I think it's cool. I've got this box from, I don't know, the 30s, 40s, 50s. I'm not real sure when. Um, so a little bit of vintage packaging. But at the same time, if you are a pen buyer, what do you do with the packaging, you know, with vintage packaging? Do you open it? Do you close it? Or do you leave it closed? Uh, and one like that, uh, that's pretty much a no-brainer because I don't think that was sealed shut. But I I saw a listing for a Geha something or other. I, I put the link in my video description. So, you know, if it's too long from when I filmed this, the link may no longer be active. But right now it is. And it's, it's a blister pack. Uh, just Yeah, kind of like how these Parker ink cartridges are in. Only it's a Geha fountain pen. And, you know, not... 1930s packaging or something but probably 80s so open it or leave the pen in the package now it, it reminds me of this funny saturday night live skit now that i've said that i've got to remember to put a link to the skit in the video description because it is funny uh it's all about the star wars toys that are coming out and these kids are playing with luke skywalker and death stars and you know whatever the toys are and uh Oh, cool! And, and then the this man, like my age man, comes up and says, or we can keep them on the shelf in their original packaging. And then he starts going on about how you buy two, uh, one to store in its packaging and one to get out to look at. And uh, it, it's, it's funny. Anyway, so that's kind of what I thought of when I saw that that uh, listing now it's not a pen i want because i own one and it will be appearing on my channel soon and i got it without the blister pack but i do know that when things are in their vintage packaging they're worth more i recently sold a uh um what was it i just sold <laughs> lamy dialogue 3 but i knocked some off the price because i didn't have the original packaging anymore and uh you no know, that's kind of a thing with uh collectors they like this original packaging so i guess people collect star wars junk and they uh want it in its original blister pack so uh i don't know i my opinion if i were presented with that pen i'm not going to store it 
my pens are meant to be written with. I've got one or two that are kind of to clean out that I don't like to write with because of the cleaning out part. And one that's just really delicate because the piston turning knob is broken. So I don't like to use that one. But uh, for the most part, I like to just ink them up and use them. If I'm not inking them up and using them, what's the point? So where do I come down on vintage packaging? I'll save it if I can. But it's not a priority to me. If later on while filming this video, I knock this coffee over on the vintage box over there. Oh, well. I mean, I'll be a little, oh, how could you be that stupid, 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 stupid. And then I'll get over it. <laughs> so there you go. That's where I stand on packaging. I don't care about it. I want to use the item. But I do recognize the historical value. Because people ask me, are you going to preserve those stickers on that pen? Nope. Because <laughs> the value to me is writing with it. And yes, I know that wears it out faster. But I'm not a museum. I'm not that kind of collector. I'm a user. I like fixing pens and I like using pens. So there we go. Uh, speaking of fixing, uh, Aiden Burnell, and I put a link. Did I? Yes, I put a link in the video description to his video. He recently did a video where he repaired an Omas pen. And uh, I just, you know, that, that's one of my fears with my own Omas pen is what if something does happen to it? How do I get it fixed? Well, you know, his wasn't the most complex repair, but got a partial answer there. Apparently you can fix them. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad he posted that. It just gave me a little reassurance. Although, you know, the what if the threaded rod that operates the piston <laughs> breaks? What do I do then? I don't know. I guess I won't be using the Omas Ojiva anymore. But uh, anyway, just uh, I thought that was interesting. And I was glad he did the video. And I just wanted to share it with a wider audience. So here I am, sharing it with a wider audience. Um, on a slightly more serious note, and we'll get unserious here too. Um, I was reading about a school, and of course it's a private school, because good luck pulling this off at a public school, but a private school that said, hey, we're not going to allow vaccinated teachers to have any contact with our students. In other words, they don't want their teachers to get, vac get the COVID vaccine. Why? Well, until the effects are known. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, th there's a possibility that if you get the vaccine and you work at that school, you will be fired for doing the right thing to protect yourself, to protect the little kids, and to protect everybody else getting fired by that school. So, crazy is out there. And I don't like to use the word crazy, but I can't think of another word that really matches what I think. So I thought that was an interesting one worth sharing. Now, uh, it wouldn't surprise me to see that attitude in North Dakota because North Dakota apparently is one of the worst states in the country for vaccine hesitancy. I didn't think it would be. I knew it was a red state, but North Dakota isn't one of those you know, science-denying states either, except for climate change. But uh, apparently, high rate of vaccine hesitancy. I would be curious to see where my county rate ranks in that vaccine hesitancy, but I have the feeling it would be one of the high ones because of, you know, the part of North Dakota I'm in. But I'm vaccinated, so I'm doing my part. It's just my fellow North Dakotans that aren't doing their part. So maybe don't visit North Dakota if you don't want to get COVID because uh, apparently the people there's a large number of people here who don't care if they spread it to you. See if I can get some nasty comments about that. <laughs> uh, on other notes, um, this week, and this will head somewhere dark again in a minute, but this week I finished up this book, Song of Kali by Dan Simmons. I'll give you a closer look here. So this is the cover of the book, it, uh, according to F. Paul Wilson. An absolutely harrowing experience. I actually felt as if I were in Calcutta. The sounds, the reek, the cloying humidity. Dan Simmons is a compelling writer. And on the back, there's a little bit more. Um, Edward Bryant of Mile High Futures mentions it. Dan Simmons understands terror and what it does to readers where Stephen King flinches, Simmons doesn't. And at the top, 
Song of Kali is as harrowing and ghoulish as anyone could wish. Simmons makes the stuff of nightmares very real indeed, which is by Locus, and I th think that used to be a magazine. And, you know, there's more. I don't really want to read all the different praise. And it's a... Uh, where is it? 1985, which uh, plays into the story a bit. And then there's that first sentence. You want to grab attention. Some places are too evil to be allowed to exist. So what I think I'm going to do, I've, I've talked about it before, but I think it'd be fun to do some book reviews as part of this channel. You know, I... You don't see it, really, but there, one of the reasons I cut back to two fountain pen videos a week is I just haven't been buying very many. So I'm kind of stretching out what I do have. But I've got a zillion books. I mean, this bookshelf that I'm basically... Yeah, this tells me I'm blocking it almost entirely. But this bookshelf behind me is just a tiny fraction of my collection of books. So uh, anyway, I was thinking I might do some book reviews as part of the channel. Uh, the pen reviews are going nowhere. They will continue. But uh, yeah, the doing three of them, you know, two pen reviews and then a pens in use every week was just... I knew it was going to eat into my collection and the whole time thing was really... A struggle for me so uh book, book reviews are a little easier in fact last night i finished the book looked over at my alarm clock and shoot it's 3 10 a.m <laughs> so the book managed to hold my interest quite well because i don't usually do that because i am not a night person and people who talk to me in the evening know i'm not a night person because i start like I won't say I fall asleep mid-conversation, but I start, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm still listening, yeah, um, you know, that kind of deal. So, uh, <laughs> maybe that's why I'm so hyper today is because <laughs> I stayed up till 3 10 reading a book. Um, but anyway, I'm going to do a book review and I want to write my notes first, but yeah. And, uh, on a less happy note, I was... It's kind of scary to read what's going on with COVID in India right now. Uh, India is experiencing what were everybody's worst fears with COVID. The reason we did the lockdown, uh, the reason we want people vaccinated, is becoming a reality in India. You know, the hospital shortages, the not able to get into a hospital, the lines outside the hospital just to get in. Uh, oxygen shortages, oxygen being shipped under armed guard. That's all happening in India right now. And it shows you how bad it could have been. So, you know, these, vet, these COVID deniers, I'm sorry, I have no patience for you. I do not take you seriously. Uh, I take the virus and the scientists seriously. And I wish no country had demonstrated it. I, for a while, I was afraid... United States might. For a while, I was afraid uh, Dakotas might because we were leading the world for a while. And there was a while I thought Brazil would. And I, Brazil still might. Who knows? But, uh, yeah. And then I found out that the... Is he a president or prime minister? I can't remember his title. But anyway, Modi. The uh, lead... We'll call him the leader of India because I can't remember his exact title. Do I have it? No, I didn't write his title down there. Uh... He, he's, they actually want uh, any social media to take down any posts critical of the government's response. And he does have authoritarian tendencies. So, yeah, there it is. And, and it's not take down lies, take down false information. It's take down things that are critical. Wow. Scary. Um... In other ex not so exciting news, this past week there was a mosque that was vandalized. Not in North Dakota, but might as well be because it was just across the river from North Dakota. It was in Moorhead. But, uh, yeah, they're out there. The, those people that... You can't just, well, okay, sorry, Islam isn't for me. No, we gotta go vandalize because you gotta know. Not only is it not for me, you're not welcome here. I, I don't get that attitude. But then I guess I'm not particularly religious, so maybe that would be why. 
But even when I was religious, I just, you know, live and let live. So I'm sorry to see that happen. You know, they always talk about North Dakota nice or Minnesota nice, but it's kind of a sarcastic term because it also has a dark side, like they're nice to your face and then they stab you in the back. So I guess that's what happened. All right, but on a happier note, uh, House Bill, get the number right, 1298 was defeated by veto in North Dakota. Uh, it scares me that it made it that far. This is the bill that was going to have the government stick its nose into the transgender in, in sports thing. Rather than let actual experts in the field figure it out. Nope! Us politicians have got to go in in all of our ignorance. And I'm not saying I have the answers for it. I just don't think that that's something that the politicians should be deciding. That's something that experts need to figure out. But uh, anyway, our, luckily our governor, although he's not one of my favorites, is uh, reasonably rational, so he vetoed it. And there was not enough of a majority in the legislature to override the veto. So we're safe for another two years till the legislature meets again. Um, we will still have this governor at that point because he was elected two years ago. No. This past fall, sorry. Same time as uh, President Biden was elected. But uh, two years after that, who knows? Uh, there is, and you're seeing it in a lot of states, and we're seeing it in this state. The extreme wing of the Republican Party is suddenly showing up at local party conventions or conferences and whatever, and electing their own people and putting their own people in and trying to get the more extreme elements into power in government. And that is scary because you know i know it's a conservative state but there's conservative and then there's crazy and you don't want the crazy of either party dominating and right now that seems to be what's trying to take over in north dakota and we will see if they do but i've definitely seen a right word lurch in the state's politics always been conservative but there is, like I said, being conservative and then the denying reality cult of personality side of conservative. And I don't like seeing that. Um, I was actually impressed with the governor of, I think it's Arkansas, Asa Hutchinson is his name. But he recently vetoed a bill that was going to outlaw any kind of care for transgender youth. And again, that's politicians stepping over their bounds. And that's exactly what he said. Now, he's a governor I would never vote for because he's pretty whoa, way far to the right. But even he said, hey, this isn't something the government should be doing. This should be for experts in the field. Uh, but in Alabama, you can override the governor's veto with a 50% vote in the legislature, which is exactly what they did. So it's now law in Alabama. Uh, and I see other states. Texas is also one that's trying to pass a bill like that. I hoping texas has enough rational people but who knows it, it, it's just um I, I don't like seeing government stepping in to areas where they shouldn't and that should be that's why i used to be conservative because i liked the idea of okay okay government knows its place but what i came to realize as i got older is yeah the right may talk small government, but they're just as much into government control and power as the left, just in different areas. And that's too bad. And uh, you, know, you might say, well, why aren't you libertarian? I flirted with that briefly, but that would be a topic for another day. <laughs> so uh, anyway, if videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I'd invite you to subscribe. You might even get to hear me say something controversial once in a while, like I did today. Uh, and uh, I don't know if... I, I brought up a lot of different things. I guess uh, maybe I'm a little curious. How are you doing in your state as far as vaccination? Um, and actually, I'm kind of curious... How much are you hearing about what's going on in India? Because honestly... Outside of one news source, I'm really not hearing about India's 
what's going on in India. And, you know, that same news source is how I found out about the coup in Myanmar and uh, other things going on in countries that aren't the United States or closely allied to the United States. You know, it, it just seems like there's a lot of news sources that ignore a lot of the world, so... Okay, I just wandered off on a new topic, so I'm going to stop talking now. I want to thank you for watching. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.